I'd like to call the um, Monday, November 1st, Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. We have a good crowd in our audience today. Our first order of business is our uh, invocation by our county manager, Ms. Sharon Griffin. I'll turn it over to her for now. Thank you, Chairman Bright and commissioners, and good morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and conduct the business of Onslow County. Please be with all of our elected officials, our first responders, and those who defend our nation. Direct this meeting so that it is full of wisdom and productivity. May all we do this day bring you honor and glory. Now with deep respect and reverence for the faiths, beliefs, and traditions of those gathered here today, join me in a moment of silence. Amen. Our pledge by Assistant County Manager, Mr. Ben Warren. Please stand. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome uh, our <coughs> elected official, uh, Sheriff Miller. As always, he's always here. Miss um, Amiga Jarman, our register of deeds somewhere out there. Thank you, Amiga. Uh, also, Dr. Barry Collins, our uh, superintendent of uh, Oslo County Schools, and uh, Colonel Chris Thomas, our uh, colonel, uh, second in command at the Oslo County Sheriff's Office for your security. Thank you, sir. We ask that all in attendance please uh, set your cell phone to silent or vibrate mode. The board offers the public one opportunity to speak during the meeting. Comments should be limited to no more than five minutes and may be on any issue upon which the Board of Commissioners has control. In accordance with the board's adopted rules of procedure, commissioners shall reserve responses, if any, for the commissioner comment period on the agenda. Now we have uh, three public hearings tonight, so if you want to speak for the public hearing, uh, you can speak for both if you want to, but you get a chance to speak at the public hearing if you're here for that. Just to let you know that we, know, uh, we have two different opportunities here. With no other items uh, on the agenda, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the meeting agenda. Second. I have a motion to hear a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Approval of the items on the consent agenda. Is there any item on the consent agenda that any commissioner would like to have removed for discussion later? Motion to approve. Hearing none, we have a motion to approve. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Griffin, we are at the item three, which is public comment. Do we have folks that signed up for the initial public comment? No, Mr. Chairman, no one has signed up today for public comment. All right, we'll move to item four. I believe that's Ms. Katie White, our Parks and Recreation Director. Good morning, Katie. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commissioners. I'm here today to present on the Parks and Recreation Comprehensive Master Plan for your consideration. Last September, the county hired McGill and Associates to draft the master plan. So why a master plan? A master plan assesses current and future recreation needs of the community and establishes a long range vision. It will also help prioritize and budget for capital improvement plans. <clears throat> the last plan was completed in 2008, nearly 13 years ago. This plan is to be used as a guide for future decision making. It is a comprehensive master plan, so it shows the big picture of a county as a whole. More detailed site-specific plans will follow, and this, this document is a living, breathing document. As demographics change and populations grow, this document can also change at any time. This document will um, make us eligible for grant funding, you have in front of you a spreadsheet that breaks down the cost. These are estimates. There's been no study into these costs. They are estimates and of course can change at any time. 
The timeline, again, is to be used as a guide. As you will see, the low-cost projects are projected at the beginning. Projects can be shifted as funding comes available. We worked with McGill and Associates to gather data and form the public input. Input was formed through public meetings. There were four of them held in December of 2020 at a variety of our parks. There was a visual preference survey which gave participants an opportunity to select what park amenities they would like to see in the future. There were also stakeholder group meetings and this was to gain a broader sense of the issues, ideas, and desires. McGill and Associates help, helped facilitate these meetings. Stakeholder participants included a representative from the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, Jacksonville Onslow Sports Commission, Onslow County Tourism, athletic groups, and league representatives. In addition, there were also four focus group meetings. The focus groups included Onslow County School Administration, surrounding parks and recreation departments, including the city of Jacksonville, the town of Swansboro, the town of Holly Ridge, and the town of Surf City, as well as park staff interviews. Lastly, a community survey was sent out to residents in November of 2020 and was also made, on, made available online for the public to participate in. In evaluating the 2020 community survey results, we also compared the 2018 community survey results and found similarities. One interesting thing in the 2018 pre-pandemic community survey results we found were that parks were the highest used county facilities. This was in 2018, and since that time we have seen more than one million annual vi visitors to our parks. The pandemic has played a huge role in getting people outside and increasing park usage. So based on the 2020 results, the following are the priorities identified by the community. The facility priorities, as you can see, walking and biking trails, an indoor aquatic center, and an indoor recreation center, fishing areas, and beach accesses. There are others listed in the um, high priority area, these are among the top. As well as what we found from the program priorities, the top priorities for investment for recreation programs, adult fitness and wellness, nature programs, food trucks in the park, family programs, as well as senior programs. Based on an assessment, of existing facilities and community input, recommendations have been formed to best serve the community. A series of recommendations and priorities have been put together. In front of you, the spreadsheet of potential cost. These costs are very generalized estimates that the consultant has put together. They're to be used as a guide. A more detailed plan would need to be developed in order to identify the actual size, location, and cost of new facilities. So those numbers are to be used as a guide. With this plan, it will also help prioritize and budget for capital improvement plans. The next steps, upon adoption of this plan, we will become eligible for a variety of grant funding. Um, listed in front of you, one of the bigger ones is the North Carolina Parks and Recreation Trust Fund grant. The application actually opened this morning and is available from November to March for funding. And at this time, that concludes the presentation, so it is res now respectfully requested that the Board of Commissioners adopt the Parks and Recreation Comprehensive Master Plan. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for uh, uh, our presenter? Motion to, a motion accept to, to report. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Did a good job. Make all it easy. In, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Our next item. Uh, we're flipping over to the rezoning issue. I think that's yours, Miss Russell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. We do have two rezoning cases to hear this morning. Um, we will have a total of three public hearings today. We are gonna do our rezoning requests first. Our first one is PREZ 2021-00004. It is the Dill rezoning request. And I will turn it over for our staff introduction, Ms. Jessie Rue, our Planning and Development Director. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commissioners. Our first rezoning request this morning is a request to go from RA to R15. This is on behalf of the Dill family. Strong Rock Engineering served as the applicant. This is about 300 feet north of Gum Branch Road on Cowhorn Road. And we'll look at some maps of this property momentarily. It's a relatively large request at 261.34 acres. <laughs> the property is currently undeveloped. It does have a utility easement through it. This is somewhat <coughs> unique in requests that we see because there is already Anwasa water and wastewater available in this area. And our land use plan does encourage that that supports this type of request. There's fire service provided by Northeast Onslow. And of course we have our traffic counts. There are no traffic counts available for Cowhorn Road. It is designed the same way as Gum Branch Road and as we are aware from previous requests, uh, we are over capacity on the street. This is the property, it's a unique shape. Um, the easternmost side of it abuts Cowhorn Road. This is our current zoning map. It is currently zoned RA. It was zoned RA before our new zoning maps were adopted as well. You can see from looking at this, we have some higher density residential in this area already. There is R10 to the south and there is some R15 to the uh, north and to the west or east. RA, primarily an agriculture district. It does allow residential development at two units per acre. This request is to go to R15. This is a medium density residential area. This allows three to five units to, per acre, depending on what kind of method you use to develop it. This is our future land use plan. To the north of this property, a little bit of this is in conservation. It's around the flood area, the flood zone area. The balance of the property is classified as agriculture and forestry. In our comprehensive plan, we look at two things. We look at the map designation and we look at the policies that, are, that, that guide the development. This is inconsistent with the designation of agriculture and forestry. However, of the policies laid out in the plan, far more support this rezoning request than do not support it. And for that reason, the planning board did unanimously recommend um, in favor of making this change. I will say as one note, this has evolved a little bit. Initially in September, the applicant approached the planning board and had asked for R10 zoning, which is a higher density than the R15 zoning request that you're seeing tonight. The planning board was not comfortable recommending to you all the R10 zoning because it does allow multifamily and a, a higher amount of homes or even in some cases commercial development. And they felt more comfortable and asked if they'd be interested in asking for the R15 zoning. The applicant consulted with the property owner, the Dill family, and they have decided to move forward with this request and it is unanimously recommended to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rue. At this time, I will open the public hearing. Um, we do have two citizens who have signed up to speak this morning. I would remind citizens that you do have five minutes exactly, and we do ask that you take your seat at the conclusion of your five minutes. I will call you in the order in which you have signed up. Please approach the podium, state your name and your address. First, Mr. Don Swingler of 170 Calhorn Road. Thank you. My name is Don Swingler. I reside at 170 Calhorn Road, Richlands, North Carolina, with my lovely wife for 43 years, and I'm a retired Marine officer. 
and my wife is a retired nurse. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I thank you for allowing me to present my case regarding the rezoning of the Dill Estate parcel from RA to R15. I provided a little handout to all of you that highlights, and on the very first is a little snapshot of the land, of the Dill land. I color coded it. The yellow portion, or it may appear to be green with a little black speck on it, that is my land. And notice the little black speck, which is my house, is right beside the land that is about to be reclassified. Entrance onto my land, I have a 1,200 foot secluded driveway which serves to block, muffle, and mitigate traffic noise from Calhoun Road. Tree removal, land clearance will serve to increase noise pollution. Our home that you saw on the little dot that's on the yellow portion of the map there is back on that driveway 1,200 feet. Our house is situated where it is, where it is because it's the only location on the property where the Onslow County Field Representative certified that the land would perk. So that is an issue. We enjoy our seclusion and privacy. As you can see from the vastness of this, there's a vastness of wooded wetlands. It's simply breathtaking. I wish you could see it in real life. I had a video, but was not authorized to bring that here that would tell the picture. Not to mention that it acts as a storm barrier, mitigating damage from hurricanes and nor'easters. The thick wooded wetland is a healthy forest teeming with wildlife. My wife and I, we sit on our back porch. We enjoy watching deer, black bear, bobcat, foxes, flocks of wild turkeys. On our parcel is the home of the red-tailed hawk, eastern screech owl, whippoorwills, snipes, snapping turtles, all of which are signs of a healthy wetlands ecosystem. Rezoning the wooded wetlands ecosystem to R15 will displace and destroy the resident wildlife. Your vote to change it to an R15 will kill this. Rezoning violates our privacy. We've worked so hard for so long to own a piece of land in the woods and to build a home to peacefully live out the remainder of our lives. We will not voluntarily forfeit our rights of privacy. Rezoning jeopardizes our personal security, exposing us to unwanted intrusion, trespass, theft, burglary, home invasion, or, or any type of crime. And all for what? All for a development, a subdivision. My wife and I don't have many years remaining to enjoy our home nor do we have the wherewithal to uproot to start all over again. We've put our life's blood into establishing what we, little that we have, and we oppose to any development that would in any manner negatively impact our privacy, our lives, our property, our wooded wetlands, and the diversity of wildlife we currently enjoy on the property. Mr. Chairman, in closing, I thank you for Give me the opportunity to address the board. And at this time, I yield back any balance of time. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Swingler. We appreciate your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ronnie Newbold. My name is Ronnie Newbold. I live at 129 Calhoun Road, which is right at this basically the beginning of this property. Mr. Chairman Jack Brighton, Rescue County Commissioner, thank you for allowing us to come this morning. And piggyback with uh, Don there, the issues that I still have is wetland issues. They're talking about building these, all these houses in there. The land, I know, is still a wet issue. It, there's a lot of wetlands in there. I don't know how you can come around allow them to get access to all that land. Another issue, that it, the sewer is on Gun Branch Highway, uh, so there's none there on Calhoun Road. So they, if it is approved, they've got to be able to tie in somehow 
if they're going to bring sewer in there from Gun Ranch Road. At present time, there's four different housing developments on Cowhorn Road, just from my house to the new school that's been built there. Traffic is an issue now, just from those four houses in that school. I can only imagine what it would be like if another housing development come in there without some type of road improvement. And that's what I, the issues that I have with this new development that might come in there along with what uh, Don has already brought up to y'all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Newbold. No one else has signed up for the public hearing. I will ask if the applicant is present and would like to speak on their own behalf. Okay, at this time, I would like to close the public hearing for PREZ 2021-00004, the DIL rezoning request. And at this time, Chairman Brighton Commissioners, this item is available for your discussion and questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Griffin. I'll open up the uh, board for a motion uh, to either approve or deny the, the zoning request. Well, I've got some questions. <clears throat> you said- no, no, Okay, you got a question, okay. Yeah, are we open up for discussion? I think, do we, do we need a motion before we discuss? We need a motion first, uh, Commissioner Knapp. Okay. One way or another. Just go ahead and do the motion. Do I hear a motion one way or the other? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Did I hear a second? Second. Okay. Now we open it up for a dis discussion and now Commissioner Knapp. Okay. Um, first of all, I thank you, sir, both of you for coming and, and speaking your mind and uh, addressing the issues. And uh, Mr. Zingler, I thank you for your service uh, very much. One of the things that I caught when you were talking about Calhoun Road, it was overcapacity. You used the term overcapacity in terms of traffic off of Gum Branch. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So in my view, looking at this, and it's beautiful property, <clears throat> we've already got other establishments out there, other uh, housing developments and things of that nature. And having seen what this looks like, and I'm, I'm glad you brought these pictures because I was looking at them intently. Um, and I agree with you, you have a right to your privacy. You have a right to, to live on land that you do not want to be developed surrounding your land to, to cause overcrowding. We already got issues on Gum Branch Road that affects Calhoun Road. Like you, sir, the, the, west, the wetlands, you know, we have a, a fragile ecosystem there, which I think is, is absolutely gorgeous. Um, <clears throat> And I, I just appreciate the fact you guys came because you're willing to t take the chance to talk about your issues for where you live, and I think that's important. You know, we have the issue I have, we have issues with trying to keep our traffic, our department of transportation needs up to speed with any development that's in that area. Okay, right now I don't see that. Okay, Gum Branch, I still think is a very dangerous road. Um, I refuse to take Gum Branch Road. If I, if I have to go the, the long way around, I won't go through Gum Branch because I've almost been in accidents on Gum Branch and my wife has too. So um, me personally, I, <clears throat> based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, I can't support the zoning issue. I know others may have opinion, but I just can't support it. Um, and I think we should leave it the way it is. And, and I agree with you, you have a right to your, your home and your privacy and, and not to be overcrowded by new developments of single family homes, um, which <clears throat> is gonna cause more congestion, et cetera. And that's just my viewpoint. Any further? Any further discussion? Um, yeah, I guess I sh I'd like to address a few of the issues. I mean, wetlands will be addressed by the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, they're not going to be able to develop on the wetlands unless they mitigate it. So, um, you know, that's not an issue for us today. Um, Gum Branch Road is in the process of, uh, of some upgrades that I hope is going to help the traffic. Um, we, we keep hearing about traffic on Gum Branch. And, and um, again, if, there, if there's protected wildlife on the land, then, then that's going to be something that the um, that will have to be addressed by the property owners regardless of, of what they do with their land. My, um, uh, my, my big concern is, is 
telling people what they can do with their land. They've got uh, 200 acres here, and they have a right to be able to, to develop it. In RA, they could develop it anyway. They could clear it and, and build two homes per acre on it. Um, they could clear it and plant corn or something else if they wanted to. Um, so I really, I really hate to tell a landowner that they can't do what they want to with their land. Um, and we have a huge need for houses in Onslow County. Uh, housing is a, is a just a, a real issue for us here. So I would have to support this one. Commissioner Buchanan, you said on the um, uh, traffic MPO, um, what is the... Um, we just had the, I, I believe the money's there, I believe now, to widen Gum Branch Road. Is that going to be widened to Calhoun Road? I believe that's correct. And yes, and I Calhoun is going to be re, uh, redrawn, and uh, their traffic light is traffic going light's there. Traffic light supposed to go in there also. At Calhoun and Gum Branch, mm -hmm. so. they're going to refigure that that whole intersection. Do you have information on that, Miss um, Jesse? Yes, based on the same meeting that they both attended, uh, they are moving forward with the realignment and the light being installed on the corner of Calhoun and Gum Branch. I believe this month that project gets started. That's correct. I hear any further? Any further discussion from any of the board members? So the property, <clears throat> if it stays RA and they decide they want to develop it, the biggest difference is two homes on the uh, 20,000 instead of th five on the 15,000. The biggest difference is that we do not allow a subdivision to be developed okay. in RA. So they could break off uh, 20,000 square foot lots as is. However, they couldn't develop it as a comprehensive subdivision um, as ordinance. in our old ordinance. I want, to thank, I want to thank the planning board too for going to R15 because R10 is just a no-no. I mean, that's just too many houses on top of each other. R15, R20 makes it a lot easier for bigger lots. That's right, and moving forward, if this was to receive new zoning, it would be subject to our subdivision ordinance, which is going to apply more standards, street sizes, amenities, and then look at those wetlands and look at the flood areas, and that is taking away from developable acreage as well. I'm just kind of looking at here, about half of this parcel is developable. Would there be a buffer required between the subdivision and Mr. Swingler's property? Um, our subdivision ordinance would not require a buffer between residential and residential, which this technically would be. If it's left like it is, um, the developer could still build, he could still uh, build homes on 20,000 square foot lot. It could, it could be broken into 20,000 square foot pieces. Of course, those would need to have road frontage and, and other things and meet our creating a lot criteria so that would limit it much more than the R15 zoning, which would allow new streets and, and a subdivision to be designed. Any further? We have a motion and a second to approve the rezoning. Uh, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. We have six to one uh, for approval. I think we have another rezoning. Yes, sir, we do. We have a second rezoning case today, PREZ 2021-00005. We call it the FOSS rezoning request, and I'll turn it over again to Ms. Jessie Rue um, for our staff background. Thank you. This is a much smaller request. This is a request for about a half acre to be rezoned from R15 to highway business. Property owner is Foe's Properties. The applicant in this case was Tidewater and Associates. And this is on Richlands Highway, 155 feet south of the intersection with Greencrest. To give you a picture of where that is, it's right across from the speedway right down here. Currently, the property is vacant, it has access to Onwasa water, private sewer system adjacent on the new shopping center, 
property is served by Southwest Volunteer and road capacity is under, well under capacity. <coughs> Call your attention to our zoning map. This area is currently zoned R15. We believe this was originally plotted with the subdivision, the Greencrest subdivision. There is highway business in the vicinity, commercial to the south and commercial across the street. Our vicinity map. So our current zoning is R15. As we just described, this is a medium density residential district, three to five units an acre. And the proposed zoning is highway business. And the purpose of highway business is to accommodate regional scale commercial uses that foster economic development on high, major highway corridors. It also allows higher density multifamily development up to 20 units an acre. This is our future land use map. And I'll remind <coughs> everyone our future land use map is in our land use plan. Our land use plan is about 13 years old. We'll start working on a new one in July. And our classifications on a land use map are not as precise as a classification on a zoning map. We have this as a high density residential area in the, on the future land use map. But you'll see right across the street here, we are in a commercial center. So, while this is classified as high density residential, there is that more commercial classification right across the street. This is a picture of the property as it looks today. It has been somewhat cleared. Right on the other side of these trees is where the Green Crest subdivision is. So our comprehensive plan has this as high density residential. So it is inconsistent, this rezoning request is inconsistent with the map. We went and we looked at the policies in the plan and of all the policies in the plan, there were seven that very clearly did not support this rezoning request and two that could be used to support this rezoning request. Now by law, we have to check the consistency. It doesn't mean that because it the request is inconsistent with the map or inconsistent with the policy that you can't adopt it. I just have to tell you that it does not match the plan. The planning board took these factors under consideration and unanimously recommended that this rezoning request be denied. Four citizens were present at this meeting and presented uh, their opinion that this rezoning should be denied as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rue. At this time, I will open the public hearing. This morning, we have seven individuals signed up for this public hearing. And if you would, please approach in the order in which I call your name. And as a reminder, please conclude your remarks within the five minute time period. Our first speaker, Mr. Thad Dodson of Dressler Drive, please state your name and address when you come to the microphone. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Thad Dotson. I live at 19 Dressler Drive. I've lived at 19 Dressler Drive now for 31 years, me and my wife. Um, before that, I lived at 15 Dressler Drive since 1975. <clears throat> since I've lived there, um, behind my house used to be all woods. John Quinlan used to own that. He wouldn't let it. Uh, the power company cut her right away. He was so particular about the woods and everything. Well, he passed on, his wife ended up selling it. Mr. False acquired it. Since then, he's cleared it all the way up to my house, and the house is bordering Green, uh, Dressler Drive. Um, we used to have a peaceful, nice neighborhood. Now we've got noise pollution, light pollution. I, I live at the very end and I can hear traffic, I mean, from 258, since the tier, all the trees have been cut, cleared off, you can hear, I mean, it's just, and I live all the way at the bottom. 
the lot that they're talking about rezoning, um, I was approached, Miss Lewis Sloan owned that. Her daddy was the one that developed um, Dressler Drive area. She inherited that. She approached me about buying it one time. I was not interested, but I did buy some other lots from her. When he cleared where his shopping center is now, they overcut the timber on that lot. I <clears throat> was kind of interested in what was going on, so I called Mrs. Sloan to see if she'd sold it. And she told me she has not sold it, and I said, well, you better check into your property some way has cut the timber off of it. And she weren't aware of that, and she was upset. So I guess her and Mr. Foss had worked something out. He acquired that property because of that. And now, I mean, just like that gas station across the street and all that, you're talking about commercial, it was there. When I first lived there, none of that was there. It was all woods. Um, the only thing was on that side of the road really was Jack Henson's place. And some of you know, remember him. Um, and then down the road, they had built a fast fair years ago. Um, since then, they keep encroaching, encroaching on the residential. And it was residential all the way up to Simpson Brothers. Um, I hope you vote no, because it's just another, it might not seem like a big, piece of land, but it's just more and more encroaching on, and, and that Greencrest Circle, by the way, has got covenants since 66, I believe, on the, on the, in the county. Um, so um, it's not, it's never was required to be a commercial. So I hope you vote no. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dotson. Our next speaker is Mr. Brian Wheat of Dressler Drive. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. My name is Brian Wheat. I reside at One Dressler Drive, where I have resided for the last 36 years. My property is directly behind the property being proposed for rezoning. Since the establishment of countywide zoning and subsequent reviews, this property has retained its R15 designation. This parcel has provided a valued benefit to the property owners bordering this property by providing screening, minimizing some of the noise and light pollution that we have had to endure over the recent years as a result of multiple development. As a result of the commercial development in this area, there's been an increase in noise, increase in violent accidents, to include one fatality just two years ago, right behind my house into the woods. Rezoning this property to highway business would only exacerbate these problems. The interruption to the families that border on this property will be constant. Currently, it's almost impossible to stand outside one's house without listening to the, the noise. At night, my property bedroom, we have to buy blackout curtains because of the light pollution coming from Mr. Fost's development since he didn't bother to put any realistic um, screening on his property between it and commercial I'm, I'm sorry, residential property. I've spent over $5,000 since he started developing the property adjoining mine to provide some limited ability for screening and a bit of privacy and, and an attempt to uh, reduce some of the light pollution. The screening that was being provided currently, I'll be long dead, gone, and forgotten before it gets six feet tall. The lights that are shining in my house are about 10 to 12 feet above the ground. Makes it pretty darn difficult. I, I would also like to point out that from the intersection of uh, NC um, 258 and Highway 17, 
and down here to uh, Northwest Corridor, a three and a half mile distance, there are 12 commercial properties for sale, ranging from individual lots to multiple acres. Additionally, there are multiple empty buildings and empty storefronts awaiting leasing. I strongly urge you to reject this requested rezoning to highway business. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wheat. Our next speaker is Mr. Jason Houston of 306 Newbridge Street. I'm the applicant, so I'll wait till the end. Actually, I'd need to call you up in the order in which he signed up, if that's okay. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Jason Houston, 306 Newbridge Street, Tidewater and Associates. Um, <clears throat> We're the one doing the request to rezone this property to highway business. Uh, this tract of land was originally uh, recorded with the Greencrest subdivision back in 1965. That was 56 years ago. Uh, lots changed in 56 years. Uh, this area of the county uh, has always been a commercial corridor coming into the Jacksonville area. And as time moves forward, uh, this area will continue to see growth. Uh, to be clear, this property has no access into the Greencrest subdivision. Its access has always been directly to Highway 258. The current landowner, Mr. Foes, also owns all the rest of the property to the south. It's all currently zoned highway business. He's had all that rezoned and through, through the ages. Uh, any access to this property today is through Mr. Foes's property. I know there's always people for and against things for many reasons, and that's why we come here and have this process. However, I would like for you to imagine for a moment that this property was already zoned highway business, and that we came here today to ask for it to be rezoned to residential. I would like to think that it would not be rezoned to residential for many reasons. One, it's on a major highway. It has no access but through commercial property. I would like to think that, I would like to not think that we would rezone this property to be residential. If you deny this rezoning request, what you're essentially saying is that you think this property is a good fit for residential. It is zoned R15. He could put three homes on it right now and provide a terrible place for people to try to access Highway 258. Also like to remind everybody here in attendance that since this commercial development was first started, we now have a new zoning ordinance that requires buffers and things that may not have been enumerated previously. If the property is left as R15, there is no buffer requirements. He can clear it and they would have no buffer at all between the back of their homes and Highway 258. Considering everything that I've talked about, we believe that this property is best suited to, to be rezoned to highway business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Houston. Our next speaker, Ms. Pam Easley of Greencrest Circle. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, my name is Pam Easley. I live at 105 Greencrest Circle. I'm right on the corner of Dressler and, and Greencrest. Um, what this would do to us, we've, I've lived there 30 some years. I moved there in 77 and it's always been a quiet neighborhood. A lot of retired people live there too, but we have children too now. And um, getting into our street from 258 has become a hazard with all the businesses going up out there anyway. Um, people get in the turning lane coming from Richlands and they get in the turning lane to go to the gas station across the street way before they even get to Greencrest. So if I'm coming from Jacksonville trying to get into Greencrest, here comes this car. There's often there's been a chance of having hit on collision because of that. That new property there, it, they would also have to have a way to get in there, so that's going to create more traffic trying to turn into that property before they ever get to Greencrest, and we have a terrible time trying to get there already. Um, the noise, as Mr. Wheat said, and 
is increased terribly. You go to bed at, I go to bed late. I go to bed at midnight and motorcycles and cars revving their engines across the street from the gas station and everything after that create a big deal, you know, and the light, like Mr. Wheat said. So I know our neighbors have also mentioned that they're, they get vagrants coming in their backyards and, um, and from that area now, and it's, uh, it's a real problem. So, and we've had many other people coming just down our street too. So um, I hope you will deny this also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Easley. Our next speaker is Ms. Kathy Butler of Greencrest Circle. She had to step out to go to a doctor's meeting, but Mr. Fred would take her place, if that's, and then I'll speak after her, or I can go now. We, we can't have anybody take her place, unfortunately, but I can call our next speaker, which is Mr. Richard Butler of Greencrest Circle. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, I really wasn't prepared to, to speak uh, on this today. Matter of fact, I just heard about this deal. But uh, as Miss Easley just stated, that it is a, almost every night, one of us that live on Greencrest or Dressler could get killed turning in there with the traffic getting into the turn lane way before the Dollar General store out there on 258. Now, I know that there's design in progress to change the way that is made, where it has a dividing turn line lane there to where we will have to go down past where we live, turn around, and go into Greencrest and Dressler Drive. And then, if we want to go to Richlands, we have to take a right to get out on the 258, go down to another turnaround, and go to Richlands. I think that's wrong. But I wasn't involved in that decision either. I didn't do my duty as an American and a citizen of Onslow County. I did not let my voice be heard. But today, I want it to be heard because I love this county. I was not born in this county, but my children were born in this county. My grandchildren were born in this county. When I get out of Onslow County, I get nervous. I know I'm coming back home unless God takes me away in a wreck or I die of a heart attack or something like that. But we, none of us know when we're going to die. But I'm so fearful that my grandkids are going to be coming to my house and they get hit out there in that turn lane on Highway 258. As others have stated, the noise, the motorcycles, the sirens that we hear at nighttime, even during the daytime. I'm retired now. And God knows what all goes on out there on those streets. <clears throat> There's more land in this county to buy than to encroach on what was written in the plot to keep that as residential. That was the owner's request. He wouldn't have put it in there if he didn't want to keep it like it is. Gentlemen, y'all hold the livelihood of the county in your hands and in your hearts. And I'm asking you to look inside yourself and do what's right, not just for the businessman, but for those people that have invested in Greencrest and Dressler their lives. I wasn't an original owner in Greencrest, but I've lived there for 19 years and I see cars day in and day out riding through Greencrest Circle that don't belong there. That's what's going to become of more people being in our backyards if y'all put this to a commercial piece of property. And again, I want to thank you for hearing my words, but the truth of the matter is big, big business gets the cream of the crop most of the time. I'm asking to do what's right for us little people, that we bought where we bought because we, we wanted the quietness of a neighborhood to where I could see my grandkids grow up and play in the front yard. I can't do that now. 
because of the people coming through there riding 40, 45 miles an hour. And the speed limit sign down at my house is 15 miles an hour because of that sharp curve in Greencrest Circle. If you don't do it for me, do it for my grandkids. I thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Our final speaker for this public hearing is Miss Amanda Glasses, Greencrest Circle. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Galosh, and I live at 101 Greencrest Circle. I am the first house um, on Greencrest. Technically, there's a house next to me uh, that the state had purchased for eminent domain, but its address is um, Richlands Highway. That half acre lot that they are trying to rezone abuts my entire backyard. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are the people who have had people in our backyards uh, since they cleared and started building that uh, commercial strip there. Um, they were on our deck. Uh, we were sitting at our table eating and we heard people on our deck. We went out, they jumped over into the neighbor's yard and took off. That is not the first time uh, that we, or that was the first time. We've had at least three other incidences since they've cleared that, uh, that people cut through our yard um, to stay off of 258. Um, and it's scary. I have two children. And if you look at that lot and if you're familiar with the uh, buildings that are already on it, are they gonna build another building there? That means when I look out my backyard, I am literally staring at a commercial building, uh, which is obviously gonna bring more people uh, which are coming in to our backyards. Um, and, and I just don't feel like there's anything else that needs to be built there. We also have the noise and um, light pollution issues. Um, our backyard, uh, my children's bedrooms abut the backyard. So we too had to purchase um, uh, light blocking um, curtains so that they can sleep at night. Uh, the noise is loud. We put um, noise canceling machines in their bedroom at night because of how loud it has become since they cleared everything back there. Um, and so for us, it it is a problem. Um, and it's not just about our, our rights, but it's about our safety and it's our comfort to be able to sleep at night, um, not knowing that people are not coming into our yards from this uh, you know, new development or for my children to be able to go to sleep at night. We, we, we don't live in the city. We didn't move to Raleigh. We moved to Onslow County because we didn't want the noise and we don't want the lights. And so the more you add to that is just, you know, more that it's taking away from our nice country setting that we chose to live in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glosh. This concludes our speakers, and at this time, I will close the public hearing for PREZ 2021-00005, the FOS re rezoning request. At this time, it is available for commissioner discussion and Motion questions. to deny. Second. I have a motion to deny and a second. We'll open it up for discussion. I will ask uh, Ms. Rue to uh, come back to the podium. Um, normally, we, um, we put a lot of weight in staff review and we put a lot of weight in our decisions on the planning board, which the planning board uh, hears a lot of the details. And from, my, from your earlier report, the planning board did unanimously deny this request. Yes, sir. That is based upon the fact in the land use plan they would recommend we, when we make zoning changes between established residential areas, that there is some kind of transitional buffer. And this rezoning request did not re provide that. Jess, well, was there any it, any way? I, I don't know if I'm probably speaking out of turn on this one, but is there any way to get some buffer? I mean, we can't do anything because we don't do roads. But is there any way that the state could come in with a buffer? We see it in Raleigh, we see it all over the place, and we have seen it in some of the developments. I think there's a buffer up on 258, if I ain't badly mistaken, in one of those uh, residential areas off of 258 that buffers it out. Is there? So commercial development of any type now, since July 1st, that abuts a residential development would be subject to some layer of buffering in our zoning ordinance. Now, that doesn't always replace a whole wooded lot as they had become accustomed to. I will point that out as well. Um, 
I'm not aware of any state buffering options that might be available in this situation. I'm just reaching out, I'm probably grasping at a straw, but I mean, it's something these people need. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, is it involved. unusual to have a carve out of an area that had been established, sounds like for like 40 or 50 years as a residential neighborhood, to carve out a highway business after it's been resident, it's owned residential for you know, 45, 50 years? That would be unusual. In fact, we looked at many of these transitions last year while we were looking at all the different maps. And if something had been a certain way a long time, even in a transitioning area, we left it as we left this. Good move. I don't think it's a good time to rezone this particular property. Um, but I am concerned about how um, uh, you know, our, our growing pains in Onslow County are, are affecting these residents and going to continue to affect people in the future. Uh, have, have they already cleared this lot, Jessica? This is partially cleared, yes, sir. So it's partially cleared. Can they put a parking lot there? Can they in the current zoning? In the current zone, you could not create a standalone parking lot. In, in the proposed zone, you would be able to expand the parking without having a conditional rezoning request where we're gaining assurance of what that development would be. I can't say for certain. But it's correct that they could put two or three houses there and we yes, would not be able to stop that? Okay. Yes, sir. However, this could be problematic because obtaining a driveway permit from NCDOT uh, would be very difficult very on residences get. in this location. So if this uh, zoning is not approved, will they have to remove that parking lot, just rip it up, or, or what will happen to the parking lot that's already there? The parking lot that is that was in the image is part of the adjacent property. But it goes over into this lot, right, or not? No, this, this to my knowledge, no. Oh, okay. I, th I thought you said it. It already had a parking lot on that property. The parking lot is on the shopping center adjacent to it. It's not on this piece of That's property. correct. Okay. That's what I was trying to clarify. Any further? We have a motion and a second to deny the uh, rezoning request. Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Rue. We'll move on now to um, proposed uh, schedule standards for rules of the 2022 revaluation. Uh, I think Mr. Harry Smith, our tax assessor and collector, will be doing the presentation. Mr. Chairman, there's been a request for a five minute break. Yep. It has been that long. <laughs> We'll see you in five right. minutes. Thank you, sir.
Call the meeting back to order. Uh, yes, the floor is all yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and Commissioners, for allowing me to introduce this item today. And we're going to talk about, uh, have a public hearing regarding the reevaluation. And first of all, when we're talking about a reevaluation, obviously we're talking about a systematic mass appraisal of all the real estate parcels that are located in Nonsley County. And the reason we do it, first of all, it's required by North Carolina general statutes. We are required to conduct periodic reappraisals of property. And the reason that we do that is to try to create a more fair and equitable distribution of the tax burden for our citizens. There are several statutes that govern the reappraisal process, uh, starting with General Statute 105-283, which states that all property, real and personal, shall be appraised at its true value in money, which means basically its current market value. 284 also addresses equity for public service companies. And 105-286 set up the octennial plan, which requires that counties conduct a periodic reappraisal at least once every eight years. But that statute also gives local boards of commissioners the option of conducting reappraisals on a more frequent basis. And Onslow County has been on a four-year cycle beginning with, excuse me, 2010. So this will be our fourth consecutive four-year reappraisal project. Over time, when we look at in a real estate market, we recognize that values differ um, and change at different rates for different types of property based on location, based on age, other factors. And also, uh, real estate is valued only every four years where personal property is valued every year. So it also creates inequities within property classes versus real estate versus personal property. So the reappraisal process is designed to adjust all the property values back up to the market value as of a specific date. Once again, with the objective of creating fairness and equity for our citizens. When we're doing a four-year reappraisal, this reappraisal is basically an ongoing process. In non-reappraisal years, our appraisal staff spends a considerable amount of time reviewing property characteristics to make sure that the data we have in our system is correct, in addition to their normal duties of picking up new construction and processing subdivision splits and those types of things. As we get closer to the reappraisal date, more time and emphasis is put on verifying and analyzing sales data which used in conjunction with the property characteristics is used to develop the rates that will be used to assess properties going into the revaluation, which is our schedule of values. In order to ensure that the values are being um, properly computed, we do statistical testing to verify that the calculated assessments are reflective of what's going on in our real estate market using guidelines that are provided by our professional association, which is the International Association of Assessing Officers, and also reappraisal standards that are produced by the North Carolina Department of Revenue. The Onslow County Board of Commissioners also has a role to play in the reappraisal process since the uh, board is required to approve the schedule of values. Um, we have a process that involves making the schedules available to the board at least 21 days prior to being considered and also making them available for public inspection at the officer, the assessor's office and the public libraries at the same time. Following, following making the schedules available, a, a statement was published in the local newspaper advising citizens that the schedules had been presented to the board and were available and also providing the date and time for today's public hearing, which has to be held at least seven days prior to adopting the schedules. After the public hearing, the board will be asked to consider issuing an order adopting the schedules and will be planning on bringing that back to you at the November 15th meeting. So there's no action required by the board today other than just conducting the public hearing. Leading up to the reappraisal notices being mailed out to our citizens in conjunction with our communications office, we will be uh, using different resources to try to pre present information to the public to let them know about the reappraisal process, including their print media, our website, uh, social media, and also town hall presentations. The new values will become effective on January 1st of 2022, and those values will be the basis for tax bills that will be issued September 1st of 2022. And that concludes my introduction, unless the board has any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. At this time, I will open the public hearing for the proposed schedules, standards, and rules for the 2022 revaluation of real property in Onslow County. No one has signed up today to speak at this public hearing. I will make one call to the audience. If you would like to speak on this matter, please approach the podium at this time. 
Seeing none, I will now close this public hearing for the 2022 revaluation of real property, and this is now available um, if the board chooses for board discussion and questions. Uh, motion, motion to approve. approve. <laughs> There's no motion necessary. There's no motion necessary. No. There's no motion. Yes, we just needed to have the public hearing. I'm sorry. Except the, oh, we uh, do that next week. Yes, I had a question about agricultural land because there was one on the radio this morning. Person had a question about agricultural land. What is there in order to be categorized a farmer to receive the lower uh, tax rate? You know, what percentage of that land has to be used, or what do they have to do to prove that they're using it for agriculture? agricultural purposes. Yeah, I believe that was referring to the present use value program and there are different categories that uh, applicants can apply for. There's agriculture which requires at least 10 acres in production of agricultural products or, or uh, crops or livestock, a five acre horticultural requirement and a 20 acre woodland requirement. And basically in order to qualify for that they have to come in during the annual listing period and fill out an application. Uh, for the agriculture and horticulture, there's also an income requirement uh, where they have to demonstrate that the property is actually being used for commercial production um, in order to qualify for the program. Our office also conducts periodic compliance reviews where we will review those properties and, and ask the taxpayer to verify that they're still eligible for the program by, by reviewing those characteristics or reviewing those qualifications that are necessary to stay in the program. So it doesn't have to be a percentage of their income just as long as they're selling livestock or selling uh, grain or whatever it is they're producing, then they're, they're good to go? Well, it's, I, it's, I hate to answer a general question without looking at a specific situation because there are instances where, for instance, if it has to be demonstrated commercial use of the property. So if there's more income being derived from the land than there is from agriculture, um, there's some other issues that come into place like sound management. They have to demonstrate that it's meeting the sound management requirement. So I'd be glad to, if there's a specific situation, be glad to investigate that and report back to you. But I hate to just give a general answer because I may not so have all the facts. So factors involved, okay. Yes, sir. I got, I got a quick question and it's going to be yes, probably a stupid one, but what constitutes livestock? Um, <laughs> Generally, it's animals that are being sold. Um, there are some prohibitions regarding boarding horses. Uh, I, I, it just depends on the situation, but the, the, the statutes are, provide pretty good guidance and the Department of Revenue pr provides guidance regarding what meets the qualifications. But it's generally plants or animals that are being sold um, and their income is derived from sale, sales of those crops or animals. No. Okay. Does the uh, applicant for Bonafide Farm have to come in every year and, and uh, demonstrate the no, use? No, sir. The, the statutes require that the assessor's office periodically review parcels that are getting deferments or exemptions. For instance, we, we conduct periodic compliance reviews of uh, folks that are receiving the elderly disabled property tax exclusion requirement. Um, and other, other benefit programs like that, we're required to periodically review those to make sure that they still qualify. I think I asked you this uh, when I called the other day to ask you about something else, but the, the uh, we do revaluation every four years, uh, <coughs> mandated for every eight years, but um, I have seen in my history of being a commissioner that sometimes we have a bubble, you know, where the properties really, um, reach uh, extremely high r rates and then uh, all of a sudden the, the market falls and then the people has uh, homes that's uh, valued for more than what they actually owe on the prop. I mean, they owe more on them than what they actually uh, pay. So is, are we looking at a bubble this coming year because the market's so volatile? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say. I, obviously, it's a concern because we know what happened back in 2004 and 5 leading up to the 2006 reappraisal. And obviously, the, the market is what it is at this point in time. And what happened back then was those values <coughs> continued to increase after the reappraisal date. But back in, I guess, 2007, 8 is, is kind of when everything kind of hit and the bottom fell out. Uh, so. As we discussed, the reappraisal was designed to capture the values like a snapshot of the market at a point in time. And we're not allowed to go back in and adjust those values until the next reappraisal occurs. Uh, so to give you an example, like in 2006, 
um, I forgot what the percentage was in North Topsail Beach, but it was a tremendous increase in the assessed values over there. Um, the market fell out in 2008 and 2009, and in 2010, when we conducted the 2010 reappraisal, we ended up dropping the total aggregate value of the beach properties by about 40 percent because the market had decreased that much. But the statutes are very specific and says we cannot make any adjustments due to economics in between reappraisal cycles. So we're basically, when the values are set for 2022, they'll stay in place until the next reappraisal is conducted in 2026, regardless of whether the market goes up or down in between. Basically, everything that the tax office does is all um, based on North Carolina general statutes. We we don't we don't have a lot of um, leeway and um, as far as commissioners goes to look at values. That's something that's done by your office and regulated by state statute. That's correct. Uh, we we don't have any any flexibility with that part of it. We do have um, an appeals process in place to, that citizens, if they feel that their value is incorrect, that they can appeal the process administratively through our tax office initially and then through the Board of Equalization Review and then to the North Carolina Property Tax Commission. But all those entities who are doing those reviews are still governed by the same statutes. Mr. Smith, yes, when sir. your uh, assessors go on uh, somebody's property, like especially large properties, do they try to notify the people that they're that they're going on their land to we, do assessment? We don't call ahead of time, but we do make every effort to notify the property and identify that they're there and what the purpose of the visit is when, when they arrive. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you for the Thank presentation. You. Uh, general items, uh, school resource officer, uh, Sheriff Miller, uh, will present that item for us. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. The Board of Education and the Onslow County Sheriff's Office have both entered into an agreement wherein the Sheriff's Office provides school resource officers to middle and high schools. The Board of Education and Sheriff Miller, myself, wish to continue this agreement and there is no financial changes uh, to our current situation, our current contract. Um, I think we would all agree that the SRO program is very important. Uh, the city takes care of the SROs inside the city limits, and we do in the county as well as the towns. And um, I think uh, everybody would agree that um, crime prevention is very important. Uh, having an officer at the scene a lot of times will keep think, um, make people think twice about committing a crime. Then in case uh, crime does occur, then at least we have the resources, trained officers that will handle it properly and bring it up uh, either to juvenile or in case of um, adult, uh, adult court. And um, the protection obviously of uh, our children, our youth, our teachers, our administrators, and our staff, general staff is very important. And then also finally, for the SRO school resource officer to set the example for our young people coming up because the examples that they set will affect um, potentially the way the children will become adults and what they uh, hold nearly and dearly. And that's to be law-abiding, good, patriotic citizens. I'm available for any questions that the board may have. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Sheriff, I got one question for you, and I've and I've been and I've been asked this of my surround uh, going, uh, going around the county. Mm -hmm. The elementary schools, do you foresee us being being required or need to have the resource officers in the elementary schools? Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, in the last couple of three years, we've had uh, problems, not here, but in other parts of the country, um, where crim crime was being committed. And the Board of Education uh, then um, was awarded a grant. Now that grant is not part of this issue. That is going to be, I'm going to bring it to uh, the Board of um, Commissioners on a separate issue. Uh, to answer your question, um, is it important to have an SRO in every school? Yes, it is, but it does cost money. So for those of us who are good stewards of taxpayer money, we have to make sure where do we need the assets. And uh, 
you know, when it comes to elementary schools, less criminal conduct is being um, recorded in those kind of schools. So what the Board of Education and the, um, basically the Department of Education, the superintendent and his staff, and myself and my staff, what we have uh, then concluded that uh, what we will do is we will take that grant that the Board of Education received and then we would make sure that we don't um, spend more money than the grant allows. And obviously, uh, in some cases, we have an SRO per elementary school. Sometimes that SRO serves two elementary schools. Right. So that will continue, but I cannot predict the future. Okay, but are y'all compiling the data now to support the issue uh, that, that mm -hmm. the parents are asking about? Uh, at the elementary school level with the crimes and stuff that's being you know, committed. Mm -hmm. uh, that data is um, yeah. public information, so it's accessible to every citizen. Okay, so thank, no, thank you, mm -hmm. sir. Any further? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> All opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Uh, B, a resolution of fire apparatus loan. Uh, Norm Bryson will be presenting that item. Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commissioners. Resolution 21021 is seeking support to obtain a 0% interest loan to purchase a fire apparatus for Back Swamp Volunteer Fire Department by using the USDA Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program. What we're seeking out to do today is to help Back Swamp in the purchase of a service unit. When you look at their ISO insurance service office rating, there's four classifications of vehicles that they have that they look at. One of those is engine, another is tanker, one is ladder truck, and the other one is service unit. This service unit that they're using is one that, be, that is allowed to be able to haul equipment to the scene to help them with uh, providing air, cascade to the scene uh, to fill up air bottles as well as bringing additional equipment. It is also one of the apparatus that is graded under the insurance surface office rating. So it does help in reducing insurance ratings uh, as the department is being evaluated. With this 0% interest loan, we're looking for it to be a 10-year loan that would save an estimated $90,264 a year over that 10-year loan because it's at 0% interest versus if it was set at 2.85% interest. Now, in a little bit of reference here in Onslow County, most of the fire apparatus that we are helping to support to buy today are through banks for 20-year loans. One of the items that the Fire Rescue Commission has put as their goals is to reduce the, the length of the loan time down to 10 years because of how much it saves in interest of the loan because you're looking at going at a 20-year loan for this same uh, uh, the apparatus for the same percent interest would be $187,000 if we were going through a bank for 20 years. So we're looking at saving considerable amount of money from the taxpayers in purchasing this apparatus. Now this is the first time that we have ever gone out to go through uh, with this USDA type of loan with the county. What we are doing is we are putting forward a resolution. If the board adopts and approves that resolution, then it would go before the board of directors for Jones Onslow, which is our gateway in getting into these USDA loans. From there, if they approve that, then the amount of money would be garnered and the application for the loan as well as the rest of the documentation and paperwork would have to be filled out and brought back to the Board of Commissioners at a later point in time. It is respectfully requested that the Board of Commissioners consider the adoption of Resolution 21021 and if approved, authorize the Chairman to sign the resolution on behalf of the Board of Commissioners. Gentlemen, if there's any com uh, questions you may have, I'll be here to answer them. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, one of, yeah. One of the things that um, Norm will tell you is that when we sit on the fire commission, we look at the, the budgets every year, and some of them are 30-year loans, and I think and get this one corrected. Didn't we not have one with 40? Yes, sir. We, we have, have one with a 40-year loan. That's just 
ridiculous to do that because the, the interest on that is just amazing. And, and Brenda's been a big help with us trying to figure all this out. And she was a big help with this, bringing this to our attention about Jones Onslow. And I want to thank her for that. So, Any further? Yes. Uh, so, Norman, is, is this a debt that the county's taking on or the fire department? And this one is a debt the county will be taking on in joint with the fire department. The loan will have to be in our name because that's how the USDA DA loan is applied for. Myself, uh, our county attorney, Mr. Brett DeSelms, as well as Ms. Brenda Reese and uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Ketchum, fire rescue division head, we all had meetings with Jones Onslow ahead of this, but going before the board to talk with them about the requirements and what it would need to be done. So what we would do is we have already in the last year's budget allocated an amount of money for Back Swamp to help for the purchase of this vehicle. What we will do is withhold that amount of money and we will pay that loan through that money that we're withholding on a yearly basis to for out that 10 year extent. So this will come out of the money that we allocate for the okay. volunteer fire departments yes. every year? Yeah. Yes, sir. It's part of their budget. Right. Okay. Hearing no further, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, proposed write-offs, uh, Ms. Christine Hoover, our health director, will be presenting that item. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commissioners, this first item that I have for you today is um, the requirement for the Health Department to present for your approval any bad debts that we have been unable to collect over a two-year period of time. So for fiscal year 21, this amount totals $1,201.20 and has been outstanding over two years. Um, this write-off is made up of charges that come from a variety of our programs, maternal health, family planning, adult health, child health, and immunization. We work very hard to try to bring in all the revenues that are owed to us, and additionally, we do participate in the North Carolina Debt Set-Off Program. Debt Set-Off does not allow balances less than $50 to be submitted, therefore, many of these could not be submitted to Debt Set-Off. And this amount um, equates to less than one-tenth of one percent of our overall accounts receivable at the Health Department. At this time, it's respectfully requested that the Board of Commissioners approve our request to write off $1,201.20 for fiscal year 21. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Motion, mm -hmm. motion to, to approve. approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All <coughs> opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Hoover. Thank you. Uh, section D, Bright Ideas Program. Um, Ms. Hoover, that's yours again. Yes, sir. This program is a grant-funded program. It was a competitive award that was awarded to the Health Department after we submitted an application in the category of community preparedness and non-pharmaceutical capabilities. This funding intends to promote breastfeeding education and enhance the education for those in our community that might not be eligible for this education through the WIC program. So it seeks to expand some of the education that we can offer. The funds will be used for educational materials, single user breast pumps, and for equipment that could be set up to support, to support breastfeeding at community um, events. The Health Department has received funding in the amount of $19,528 to fill programming gaps and no county match is required. It's respectfully requested that the Board of Commissioners accept this funding in the amount of $19,528 for the agreement addenda that would be number 514 revision one and allow staff to complete necessary documentation to, to utilize these funds. Motion, motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Compensation <coughs> General Manager for Onslow County ABC Board, uh, Mr. DeSelms. Um, I think we have somebody else that's here, but. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll provide an introduction for you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The Onslow County ABC Board has requested permission to increase the salary of their General Manager of the Onslow County ABC Board by 5%. The current salary, salary of the general manager is $136,510.40, and the proposed increase will result in a salary of 
$335.92. A resolution has been prepared for your consideration should you wish to adopt the proposed increase in salary. It's my understanding that um, Commissioner Buchanan and a representative from the um, Onzo County ABC Board, Mr. Gary Dixon, um, he's present and can answer any questions that the board may have. Gary's the chairman of, the, uh, of our ABC Board that we appointed. Chairman and Commissioners, any questions you got? I mean, I can be real brief. I, we don't waste money, just like the Onslow County Commissioners don't waste money. Uh, we do things uh, based on needs, and this is a need for her because she didn't request it. This is requested by the board, the ABC board, based on a performance-based evaluation that we do every year. And it's just tied back to a general statute where we can't give her that raise without your permission because it's tied back to the uh, clerk of court pay. So we have to maintain that level without your permission. And this would be a one-time thing. If we, if we wanted to do it again next year, then we would have to do the same thing. We'd have to come here and present it again. And one of the things that, that she does, and I'm a liaison to the board, I'm not a voting member. I, all I do is give them information and liaison, but this board assigns everybody that's on that board to that board. Uh, and Gary is the chair, I've been the chair for several years, and Anita had started off as, as actually working for the ABC board as a chair mm -hmm. of that board, and then that's she was, correct. by the board members that we put in place, made her the actual director of that facility, and she runs six stores. And the money that we get from the ABC store, a lot of, these, a lot of people don't understand what we get, but Onza County General Fund, get, this year we got $1,151,665. That's just one point. It's higher this year than it's ever been, but it goes to the other municipalities, City of Jacksonville, Town of Swansboro, Holler Ridge, and Richlands. And she does an outstanding job. And like Gary said, she didn't ask for this. The board, the board members that we appointed made this recommendation to us. And she supervises anywhere in between 60 and 65 employees in six stores with an office staff of three. She has three people. She does not have an assistant administrator. She does. She does it all and moves a lot of stuff around and, and deals with the pr whatever product comes in, which you're running into a problem now because we, we, have to, we actually can't get any of the product from Raleigh because of the system. How was the 5% uh, yeah, how did y'all get It's up that? based on a performance-based evaluation and the recommendation of the board. You As know, I look we at gave the county employees a 2% raise and a bonus. I see this is here, um, and I know I'm going to get off balance here just a little bit, but just endure with me for just a second. Uh, did the other 60 employees get a raise? They get a, they get a raise based on an evaluation, uh, based on their, their date of hire, yes. Okay, then, then how much was that raise? Well, it depends, -wise, it, depends on, it depends on the evaluation for the certain employee. I mean, if, if you for, don't example, have if, for example, vote. if she did an evaluation on me, and performance-based, and it came out to 3%, there's a formula, it comes out to 3%, then that's what I would get. But she does, I can tell you right now, she does not have an evaluation, not one, that I've ever done mm -hmm. that uh, is anything other than excellent. Yeah, now, uh, as, as Commissioner Buchanan stated, that this year, we, now we had an up scale in the sales of ABC products in our stores. Yes. Okay. Based on the situation that we're now we're living in today with Corona and everything else. Uh, I believe that had a lot to do with it because people are home. Now what's going to happen next year if that same level is not main, now maintained? Well, now I can't foresee into the future, but I can tell you that every year since 2016, we have increased the sum of money that went to Oslo County. That's correct. Okay. And the, the other thing too, I think he might, I think he was asking what we did for the employees of the ABC board. They got a five percent raise. Oh, they got a cola. They yes, got a they cola got a cost 5%. of living, but they also get an an, an employee improvement raise based on a 
evaluation also. But Plus, coal is not a raise. A raise is what I'm looking at as a percentage itself that will go towards their benefits that, you know, that's offered to stay. Right. State, they, they have state an state opportunity to get both. Right. Okay. Gary, it's just like, it's just like the government, okay? You know, in my profession, when we, they were giving out bonuses, it's the same principle. You can't estimate what the percentage is going to be because if you get a, you, what we call our PARS form, okay, as an NCIS agent, you sit down and you get a rating. And then you're, they base that rating on uh, bonuses for the end of the year. So do you get a 5% increase? Do you get a 10%? Do you get a 12%? You know, it, it all varies for each individual in the job description. It's kind of the similar thing, correct? Exactly. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint whether this person's going to be what happens next year uh, if they don't perform at that particular level. Like you said, it's an evaluation. You evaluate it at that time when that time arrives. Correct? But I can also tell you that uh, each month yep. uh, this year that we've had, we've only had one decrease in revenues based on last year. No, there's no Just doubt. I've seen, I've seen the work. I've seen the increase. I've seen, I've seen the, the uh, revenue that's been generated, and I see it. I just seen a continued progression. So I don't have a problem with this at all. One, well, one of the things, too, that Gary's not told you about is that they're trying to compete with Walmart and all these other places, and they just raised all their employees $5 an hour to make them competitive at $15 an hour, and which is smart because they're having a hard time getting employees. And the employees, I can tell you, I, we, we have to go to the stores every once in a while and talk to the employees, and they are ecstatic about this $5 or the extra they've got. Any, any more uh, questions for Mr. Dixon? No, I'm good. One of, the, uh, one of the primary things that I look at whenever I consider issues of pay and, and that type of thing is fairness. Uh, Mr. Brett DeSalem sent us out a spreadsheet on the the pay received by general managers for ABC stores across the st for ABC uh, boards across the state, and uh, we are at the top already in Eastern North Carolina. Anyway, we're ahead of Carteret, Craven, Pender, Pitt, New Hanover, Cumberland. Two of those counties have a greater population than we do, so I think uh, we're already at a fair. If we're looking at the market. If we're looking at what everybody else is doing, we're already extremely fair. Plus, you don't even add into that 401k and health insurance, which, of course, is a additional benefits that are provided. So, um, yeah, I, I think if, if we look at it in terms of fairness, we're there. I mean, we're in excess of what larger counties are doing. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, if we look at uh, Cumberland counties, it was 123,407. You look at New Hanover, which is um, larger than we are as well, and New Hanover is at $106,038. So uh, I, I just don't understand why there's that imbalance and, and why we need to do so much better than everybody else in eastern North Carolina is doing. Of course, Wake and Mecklenburg, they're bigger than us, and they're going to pay more, but I understand that. Excuse but me. uh you, know, you compare it with Eastern North Carolina, Excuse we're me. head and shoulders above what everybody else is doing. Excuse me, gentlemen. Can we get a motion? And motion then we can motion to approve. Discussion? Can second. we get a motion on the floor? And a second. And a motion and a second. Now we can go into discussions. <laughs> so I was wondering why we are head and shoulders above what everybody else in Eastern North well, Carolina is doing. in my opinion, doing. I'm going to give you an opinion and then I'm going to uh, give you a fact. In my opinion, our administrator is top notch. I mean, just what I told you, she's been involved in. We have rebuilt brand new uh, three stores and remodeled two under her tenure. And all this is paid for. We don't owe a dime. It's all paid for. Now, the fact that I'm going to give you, and I can't tell you exactly because I would have to go look it up, is that some of those uh, counties have assistant administrators that they pay. We don't. She does it all herself. Like I said, with an office staff, staff of three and a warehouse manager. Yeah, I would, I would have liked to have known that, especially for Cumberland and New Hanover, because I know that you know, with a military base there in Cumberland County and with a university in New Hanover, I'm sure they do a tremendous volume of sales in those two counties because they're in excess of, I think, 234,000 in uh, Cumberland. Uh, maybe 240, 250,000 in New Hanover. So we're talking about you know, areas that are bigger than we are that don't pay as much. And so that's, that's why that would have helped me. Any further? 
We have a motion and a second uh, to approve. Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. How many? Uh, I didn't catch all the ones. Two. Two? We had two no's and four yeses. Two, okay. No, no, five yeses. Five yeses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank Dixon. you very much. Motion carries. Um, item seven is appointments, consolidated human services. Uh, Ms. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. We have uh, two items today for appointments. Our first is to the Consolidated Human Health Services Advisory Committee. As you may recall, on June 10th, 2013, the Board of County Commissioners at the time adopted Resolution 13-010, which consolidated social services and health department functions under county government pursuant to Session Law 2012-126. This board has 11 members that represent different areas of expertise. Mr. Michael Richards, general seat number two category, and Dr. Connie Bruce Gilliam, dentist category, have expressed a willingness for reappointment in their seats and have submitted citizen participation applications for consideration. No other individuals have expressed an interest in serving at this time and the applications are on file and have been certified by the clerk's office. We respectfully request that the Board of Commissioners consider the reappointment of both Mr. Michael Richards, general seat number two category and Dr. Connie Bruce Gilliam, dentist category for a three-year term expiring on November 18th, 2024. Motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor of the motion for the two, uh, for the appointment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Fire Rescue Commission, Ms. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This appointment will be uh, made by ballot from the Board of Commissioners. The Onslow County Fire Rescue Commission was created by the Onslow County Board of Commissioners to oversee the volunteer fire departments and advise the Board of Commissioners. The commission is comprised of three members from the fire service and uh, a director of emergency services, the Onslow County Finance Director, a county commissioner and an insurance agent and a member at large. The Onslow County Fire Chiefs of the Volunteer Fire Departments have met and they nominated the following individuals to consider for seat number four for the Volunteer Fire Department category. Mr. Steven Sanchez or Mr. Timothy Bruns. Ballots have been prepared and have been given to the board for your convenience. The applications from both of these candidates are on file and have been certified by the clerk's office. We respectfully request that by written ballot that the Board of Commissioners consider appointing a representative to seat number four, volunteer fire department category for the remaining two-year term, which expires March 7th, 2022. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the new member of the Fire Rescue Commission will be Mr. Steven Sanchez. Thank you. We'll move now to item eight, uh, consent agenda. We didn't have anything moved to the consent agenda, so we are now to um, manager's comments. Ms. Griffin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I have a few brief comments today. One, we were, uh, we often welcome new employees on Mondays in orientation. Today we had a full house. We had 11 new hires, and I'm very happy to say that six of these were EMTs, which we've been trying to get, and we're very excited to welcome them to Onslow County. I also wanted to let the public know we are beginning repairs now after having gone through a competitive bid process on the New River Waterfront Park in Jacksonville, and we anticipate that construction will take about 120 days, uh, depending upon the weather, probably. Um, in, on the COVID front, a little bit of good news. We actually have come down on our daily rate of new cases. We are still having new cases, though. We've had 34 that have been diagnosed since Thursday, which brings us to 30,049 cases. We've cleared 29,567 cases, which means at this moment in Onslow County, we have 482 documented active cases. The state is currently at 4.4% positive and Onslow County is at 5.7% positive, which is up, unfortunately, from last week. So even though we are um, looks like our daily average is coming down. We have had um, we have had some increase in our percent positivity, and I was just noticing that I did not write down our fatalities, but we did have four additional fatalities since Thursday. Unfortunately, we are still seeing a higher fatality rate, and all of those individuals were less than 65 with comorbidities. At this point, 62% of Onslow County residents have had at least one dose of vaccination. And that's all I have for today, unless you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Uh, we'll move now to Commissioner Comments. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank y'all and have a good afternoon. Commissioner Price. I'd like to thank everybody that spoke this morning uh, on the various uh, zoning issues. I uh, appreciated the feedback, and, and I think it helps the board make a good decision whenever they uh, hear from the community and, and the impacts it'll have on, on in their neighborhoods. And so that, that really brings it home for me especially. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ms. Griffin for continuing the tours uh, of the various facilities, which help, helps us realize what the capital long-term capital needs are. I think we went out to animal services the other day and enjoyed, enjoyed the tour and uh, wouldn't mind a honey bun that it used to catch a fox. They wouldn't mind that uh, being used as the refreshments at the next uh, opening <laughs> of uh, animal services, maybe down the road. Other than that, have a good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Nett. First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and speaking. Um, a lot of these times we sit here as commissioners and people at home see these uh, rezoning requests and stuff and that we don't we don't pay attention, we're not listening, but we are. It's obvious because people that, you know, my philosophy is if you are part of a rezoning request and you put something in, you should be here. Plain and simple, if that's your property, you should be fighting for it. And I appreciate you coming, uh, serving, giving your side and, and whatnot and the people responding. Because if it's that important to you, then you would come here knowing that it needs our approval, that you would say something or at least support those who are, who are speaking. So rezoning issues are not really taken lightly, they're taken seriously. And I know our planning department works hard to, uh, to do what they can. Um, on the other, on the other hand, uh, foot is the vaccinations are still being offered for COVID-19. If you're on the fence, I highly encourage you to get your shot or your booster. I just got my booster. Um, it was a fun ride for a day after getting my booster, but uh, you know I've got my three-shot series. So, if you're on the fence and you're still undecided, um, I would highly suggest you do it. If you look at our numbers, it would indicate that the vaccinations are working. At least that's just my opinion. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Hoover. But as we start to get more people vaccinated, the numbers are coming down. So to me, it's pretty obvious that that it is working. Uh, whatever theory that you you uh, claim to support. So I highly encourage you to do that. Other than that, thank you for coming and enduring this long meeting and we'll see you another time. And Gary, good seeing you. Commissioner Buchanan. Thank you everybody for being here and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett. Thank you everybody for being here and I understand that the county has, uh, county employees can get flu shots for free too, right? 
That is correct. They have influenza shots available to them at Reload Drugs. All right. Thanks influenza. for being here. <laughs> Not flu. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chairman, <laughs> Tim Paul. Just uh, repeat, thank you everyone for coming out today, citizens voicing their concerns and their desires of being a part of government. Like uh, Commissioner Knapp said, we do, we do listen and try and make the decision that's in the best interest of all parties. And today, two zoning things that were two different items. Um, it's even tougher when you know all the parties that are involved on both sides of the fence, but you still have to make a, a decision that you feel is in the best interest of everyone concerned. And uh, interesting tour at the landfill last week. Um, hats off to the folks that are taking care of the landfill with uh, the purchase of that shredder. And what it is saving money across the board is, is pretty impressive with how they recycle things that go to work on that landfill that we don't have to go out and purchase. So that was uh, quite interesting. So glad to see that work and people really thinking of how they can save money for everyone here in the county. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.